Are you everybody? Can you yes, see a thumbs up? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you can go live now. Okay. Anil, give me a heads up when it's live. Yeah, it's live now. Hi, everybody. Very good evening to all, and uh, definitely a good, very good morning uh, to a few of the guests uh, from US. Uh, welcome to HCL Foundation Academy. This academy is an online uh, platform uh, by HCL Foundation, which is a CSR arm of HCL Technologies. Now, COVID-19, we all know uh, this. Globally, 3.3 million plus uh, infected people and 200,000 plus deaths so far. And now here and then we are uh, hearing a lot of news um, um, about it. On 5th April, we heard another news that came from Bronx Zoo. Uh, and we heard a four-year-old Malayan tiger got infected by COVID-19. And post that, we heard news that another seven big cats have similar infection. It's a clear case of human to animal transmission. And it's confirmed by uh, WCS who manages uh, this zoo. It raises quite eyebrows as, and, as India is a mega biodiverse country. And we have currently more than 160 uh, rescue centers and zoos uh, in India and many tiger reserves and a great uh, cat population, a uh, wild cat population, uh, so to say. Uh, so the, all the authorities uh, quickly plunged into action and uh, used all the necessary uh, uh, guidance uh, to the uh, various uh, park authorities, PA um, uh, networks, and zoos to take care of uh, uh, the situation. But still, we have quite a lot of questions in our mind. How we actually came up uh, and find that there is a, a COVID, it is COVID-19. How the authorities actually reacted um, uh, to this case. How, what are the signs uh, uh, behind all this? So there are all uh, many more questions in our mind. So to find uh, um, uh, those answers today, uh, we have Dr. Chris Walzer and Dr. Pa Patrick uh, Thomas from Wildlife uh, Conservation Society and Dr. S.P. Jadav from Central Zoo, Member Secretary Central Zoo Authority uh, with us. So with all this uh, background, I'll uh, just hand over um, um, uh, to my co-host, Trisha, to take us uh, to the next session uh, of this webinar. Over to you, Trisha. Thank you. Thanks, Shantanu. So before we jump right into the webinar, I just wanted to introduce the Habitats Trust a little bit and tell you about our work. So the Habitats Trust was established in 2018 by Ms. Roshi Nadar Malhotra, the Executive Director and CEO of HCL Corporation with the aim of protecting India's natural habitats and indigenous species of flora and fauna. The mission of the Habitats Trust is to create and conserve sustainable ecosystems through strategic partnerships and collaborations with stakeholders at every level. To know more about our work and our programs, please follow us at www.thehabitatstrust.org. Now, without further ado, I would invite Dr. S. P. Yadav, member, member secretary of the Central Zoo Authority, New Delhi, India, to deliver the keynote address. Dr. Yadav. Uh, thank you, Trisha. Greetings from the Central Zoo Authority. The Central Zoo Authority, or CZA, is a statutory body under the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, Government of India. At the outset, I sincerely thank the HCL Foundation Academy and the Habitat Trust for organizing this webinar on such an important issue, which has become a huge challenge before the mankind. I also thank experts from WCS and Bronx Zoo for joining. As you are aware, India is a mega biodiversity country having the largest tiger population in the world, largest Asiatic elephant population, largest single heart rhinoceros population, and the only home to Asiatic lion. We also have distinction of having more than 16% cattle population of the world. And all these with 1.3 billion people. All these factors combined together, we are facing the real challenge and fixing time in the COVID-19 pandemic. Coming back to the zoos, the CJD was created in 1992 by the government of India to oversee functioning of Indian zoos and provide them professional guidance and technical assistance. 
At present, there are over 160 zoos, safaris, and rescue centers in the country. These zoos house over 550 species of animals, which nearly 150 are endangered. With close to one, uh, with close to 70 million visitors annually, zoos serve as an ideal location for nature education and awareness. CJD has been in the forefront to promote scientific management to ensure optimal welfare standards, including high standards of health and hygiene in zoos. I have a small PowerPoint presentation. May I have PPT, please? Yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented situation which makes us think about the proximity of interaction between animals and humans in the context of emerging infectious disease that are zoonotic in nature. Time to time, there have been several animal-borne diseases like Ebola, Zika, avian influenza, swine flu, anthrax, and so on, challenging the scientists and doctors world over. COVID-19 has forced us to realize that infections can cross natural reservoirs and affect humans in a serious way. Lack of a proven vaccine or treatment methodology makes the job of management of such disease hugely difficult and further the situation becomes more complicated when the virus mutates and doubles several strains. The next slide, please. The detection of COVID-19 in tigers at Bronx Zoo is a matter of concern that the infections undergoing cross-species transmission and also phalets a tiger, lion, leopard are among the most common species housed in Indian zoos. Next one, please. So this uh, Bronx uh, Zoo report uh, by in the US that uh, created a kind of alarm to us because of this pandemic, countries across the world are under lockdown and zoos. And this, this alarm led us to think about how we can prevent the transmission of uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 from human to animals and vice versa. The next slide, please. Because of the pandemic, countries across the world are under lockdown and, uh, and zoos as a result are facing many challenges like managing feed for animals, maintaining high levels of hygienic hygiene, and besides financial challenges. Besides these, the additional challenges of being on high alert to ensure detection of infections in zoo animals as well in the people handling them. Next please. To facilitate zoos, the CZD has issued a series of advisories, including a special request to the state governments to declare zoos as essential service. Based on the intervention by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, upkeep of zoos was declared as an essential service, which was a great help in upkeep of zoos across the country. Next please. I'm sure sooner or later we shall overcome this crisis posed by the COVID-19, but we must get ready to handle emergence of such disease in future. The CZD is pursuing a proposal to set up a national referral center for wildlife disease management, monitoring, prevention, surveillance, and research. This will contribute to the understanding of emerging wildlife diseases and their zoonotic potential with reference to screening and proposing suitable management interventions. With these words, I close my remarks. I'm eagerly looking forward to hear experts from Wildlife Conservation Society and Bronx Zoo who will provide specifics to the detection and management of COVID-19 in big cats. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Yadav. That was very insightful and thank you for sharing that valuable information with us. I'd now like to invite Dr. Chris Walzer Executive Director, Health Wildlife Conservation Society, Bronx, New York, and co-founder of Conservation Support Network to uh, please take over. Good morning from the Bronx. Um, I hope you're all keeping well. Thank you very much for that um, presentation, Dr. Yadav. And um, I'm just gonna give you a background about what we know and what, what we don't know um, based on the science that's out there because it's a bit confusing. And then I will hand over to my colleague, Dr. Thomas, who will give you the details about um, 
uh, the zoo side of things. And I'll just give you a little bit of an overview. So we, are, we already know, and we already heard that zoonotic diseases are those that move between humans and the animals. It's important to understand they go both ways and that most of the emerging infectious diseases nowadays are dominated by zoonotic diseases. From the emerging ones, that's the new ones that are spreading, it's actually 70%. So that's a, a really high frequency. And if you look at it sort of a graph across the, the last um, you know, uh, 100 years or so, um, you'll see it's quite obvious there's this massive increase in the past um, decades. And, you know, they're, they're quite diverse, you know, Nipah virus, um, MERS, coronavirus, they're using different strategies um, to expand their range. So what do we actually know about this COVID-19 outbreak? It's quite confusing, I'm sure, as you're out there. And because there is confusion, that always leads to a lot of, you know, to what's been termed as the infodemic. And there's a lot of um, um, unknowns out there. So let me just point it out. We all know that somewhere end of November, mid of December, uh, a specific um, infectious uh, pneumonia was started circulating around the area in Wuhan, China. The original cases, um, about 50% of the original cases were linked to a wildlife trading market. And um, so there was a big focus on that market. And that probably also led to a certain bias in, in reporting because in the original case description, which is always important to understand, the case description is what drives the, the um, subsequent statistics and everything. The first case description in China did include contact to the Wuhan market. But just to be really clear at the onset, this is a disease which had a zoonotic spillover event, probably a pretty singular event, or at least of a singular um, clone of the virus, and then subsequently is now a human to human dis spreading disease. And this is really important to keep this in the back of your mind. There's a lot of interesting things going on, but this is a human to human disease. Everything else is just a side note. We have 3.3 million people officially infected. Probably there's, you know, 6 million or more infected silently. So this is really important to remember that. But let's go back to that market. So there's something quite special about these markets in Southeast Asia and in China, as you, as you probably know. The most important fact is they're live animals. This is quite unique. When you see it on a global scale, there are not many other areas in the world that um, serve basically pr and process live animals, live wildlife in that um, extent. Up to a hundred species can be mixed together in close quarters in these markets, okay? And then you, you add in domestic species, mostly poultry and pigs, and of course, all the humans. Because the animals are alive, they are able to shed virus for that entire time and um, share these virus um, components or bits of the virus with different species. Now, we don't know very much about what happened actually at the spillover event. One thing that we do know though, is that environmental samples taken at that market, there were about 500 samples taken, 33 of them were positive. And of those 33 positive samples, 31 of them originated from what's the Western part of the market which is the part where the wildlife was housed. So that's quite a strong signal, but it's not proof because there were obviously people there as well. What else do we know? We know that the evolutionary host of this virus is uh, in the bat shoe virus. It's a coronavirus from the horseshoe bat species, one of the horseshoe bat species, which are very um, common throughout um, Southern China and Southeast Asia. That's the evolutionary host. What we also know from our work in the past two decades, um, sampling at markets, um, mostly in Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, and our colleagues also in China, of course, is that there are a lot of viruses out there. And it's estimated that there are about 1.7 million unknown viruses in just birds and mammals, about 1.7 million. And of those 1.7 million unknown viruses, one estimates that there are about 700,000 which have the potential to infect humans. So just to put it in perspective, this is obviously based on modeling. So let's assume they got it really wrong. That's still a lot of viruses, even if they got it wrong by you know, 10 or something, that's still 70,000. 
that's enough for me to not sort of put my bets on having a pan coronavirus vaccine or something like that. So just to put the things in perspective, so what else do we not know? So whereas we know from some of the other coronaviruses like MERS, um, we know that MERS um, reservoir host is in a bat and, in, and it uses the dromedary camel as an intermediary host to infect humans. We assume that in SARS-1, the original SARS back in 2002 and 2003, um, civet cats and raccoon dogs served as intermediary and maybe amplification hosts, both species which are bred in captivity in farms for, for consumption in China. But one thing is very clear, we do not know how the virus acquired the necessary traits to infect humans in the SARS coronavirus 2. There's been a lot of speculation and this is the problem, as I said, once you don't know and don't have any clear cut information and there's then there's all kinds of stuff which comes up. It's not snakes, that's for sure. It's not bat soup, and it didn't come from space. And the poor pangolins as well, which have been, you know, in every medium, there is no proof at all that um, pangolins were an intermediary host. The only thing we know is that pangolins have the receptor ability to potentially infect a human, but that's it. The virus in the pangolin is very, very distant from this SARS coronavirus too. So to date, we do not know where this natural spillover from wildlife, uh, which the intermediary host is. There are two, um, conf two uh, most likely explanations. One is that it moved from a bat into a, another mammal species, another wildlife species, most likely into one of the farmed wildlife species, because that gives you a large pool for the virus to develop. Alternatively, it could have moved directly from a bat, bat into humans and then had a cryptic evolution phase in humans, and then the humans brought it back to the market. Um, that's two, these are the two um, hypotheses that are out there right now, and um, I, I'm not so sure we're going to find out soon which way it went. So what else do we know about other species? Um, I circulated a, a list, I think you must have all got it. And if you haven't, then um, we will uh, make sure you get it afterwards. So certain animal species have been um, either experimentally or naturally infected. The reason there's a lot of research going on in infecting other species is because um, researchers are looking for animal models to work on. And as you can see here, the two species which can be infected is especially the ferrets. And we just saw there's a new outbreak in ferrets in the Netherlands in a, in a breeding farm. And then the cats have always been shown that they are, you're able to infect cats experimentally and there have been natural infections. Let me just put it in context though. There are 3.3 million cases of um, official cases of coronavirus. There are a lot of cats in this world and I can still count them on you know, two hands. There were two in France yesterday. There's the, the Bronx tigers, there's the lions in the Bronx. There's a few cats in Belgium. There's one here, there's one there. It's not like really prevalent. Dogs um, are very, you can infect a dog. I think you have to try really hard. Um, I can, we can discuss that if you want. You can infect chickens, pigs and ducks. That doesn't seem to work well. Experimentally, you can infect all the primates. That's pretty obvious. Um, but as I said, there's some other ones on here on this list. If you look at it, it's quite interesting. Hamsters, for example, hamsters also can um, be infected with coronavirus. So, um, sorry, I just got a funny thing here. Okay, let me just move. The other, whoops. The other thing that's interesting to realize, the virus is not mutating very quickly. About two mutations per month. Most of these mutations are in areas which have no consequence. So that's really good for us in the sense of vaccine development, but it's also important to realize it doesn't um, mutate fast. So switching species again is, you know, keeping our fingers crossed. Um, doesn't look like it's something that's gonna happen. Generally switching species is really complicated and difficult. So just back to the cats quickly, experimental infection of a cat will lead to um, transmission from cat to cat under lab conditions. In real life, it's probably possible, but we don't really have proof for that. 
okay? Because unfortunately, the environment we're working in in real life is full of people which have got coronavirus, yeah? So unless you test absolutely everyone, you never know where the virus came from. And this, by the way, is gonna be difficult to determine an intermediary host because there are just so many people with an infection. There is absolutely no evidence at the moment that a cat or any other animal can infect a human. That's also really important to understand. That is really, really important. What are you supposed to do? This is OIE reg, you know, recommendations. Don't kiss your cat. And I'm sure Pat is gonna tell you something similar. Don't kiss your tiger. That's gonna be the same and lions. So that's, um, social distancing seems to be a really useful tool um, also with cats. And I just wanna bring up my father who, um, you know, he's been following this and sending me tips every morning. I'm sure your parents are also tipping you, writing as if I don't read the news, he will send me every article on coronavirus, which keeps me occupied. But one thing he did write to me, which I thought was insightful when the first tiger case was notified, he said, I thought social distancing with tigers was the norm. And I always thought I was quite good actually, that he initially grasped what the problem was. Anyway, if you have a house cat, domestic cat, um, you know, wash your hands, that's the other thing. So let me jump back just quickly to finish this up. So it's really not about bat soup, civets or pangolins. It's all about interfaces. It's about interfaces which are increasing between wildlife and um, humans. They're increasing everywhere. It's very difficult for a virus to switch species and to cross all the barriers. On the right hand side, you will see sort of all the barriers which need to be passed for a virus to actually get into a human and then actually replicate and transmit from human to humans. One of the good ways of doing it, if you really want to try to make this happen, is to have a market with live animals and put a lot of species in there, stress them, keep them under terrible conditions, slaughter them on site and put in a thousands and thousands of humans. That's a really good way of creating a spillover event. So we're really focused on banning these market interfaces. Furthermore, we have shown that as you move, like this is of bamboo rats, and you, uh, sorry, field rats in Southeast Asia, if you move them along the value chain for food, their, their positivity to coronavirus increases. So it's if you're gonna eat one, eat it on the field, it's better than eating it in a restaurant where every second one already has a coronavirus. So this is quite new um, information. Once you've cooked it, like on the bottom right, when it's all with chili and all everything, you're fine because the virus is obviously inactivated. So that's one way. It's not the customers in the restaurants, it's actually the cooks which are at, um, at high risk. One of the other things we have to always concentrate on is these huge pools of susceptible species, which are the porcupines, the bamboo rats, the civets and um, raccoon dogs. These are genetically depauperate populations bred for um, food consumption. If the virus gets in there, it's absolutely very easy for it to evolve and develop new traits. So we've got to keep our eye on these farms. And obviously um, from WCS's point of view, this is something we really need to stop. And as a, the Chinese government and the governments of Vietnam are moving very strongly now to, to ban these, these kind of things. Finally, I just want to take one step back. When we talk about banning um, wild food, um, we do have to be very clear that this does this is really focused on the commercial trade of wildlife for food and it's not related to indigenous peoples and local communities that are reliant on using wild meat so that's especially across africa where we have millions of people who depend on this protein source but we do need to provide them alternatives and we need to have um, systems in place to pick up if outbreaks happen in those areas so WCS is doing a lot of work on these front lines of spillover using modern technology and to sample carcasses as they become available. So that's one of the things we're, we're doing and we tie that in with community work um, on these front lines of spillover. In order to do this, we need to be and gender and use a one health approach. And I'm happy to talk about that later as we go on. And just to finish up with my last slide. So what does WCS want to do? And I really, um, encourage you to visit our website and to read the policy, which is a lot more nuanced than some of the messaging, of course, which you know, we use on social media. But basically we want to permanently ban the commercial trade of wildlife for consumption. We want to strengthen the efforts to combat trafficking of wild animals you know, within the countries and across the borders. 
want to work to change chain dangerous wildlife consumption behaviors, offering alternatives, but especially in the urban centers where there are millions of people who are not at all dependent on eating wildlife. And obviously we're working very hard to mainstream a holistic um, one health approach to address this problem. So thanks very much for that. And I'm going to give on, pass on to um, um, Dr. Thomas. So, Sorry, if go. I could just introduce Dr. Thomas for a moment, please. Go ahead, yes. Um, <clears throat> so now, we're, uh, thank you so much, Chris. That was very insightful. And I know you've given everybody in the audience a lot to think about this evening and going forward. Um, I'd now like to invite Dr. Patrick R. Thomas. Dr. Patrick R. Thomas is the curator of mammals at the Bronx Zoo and is with Wildlife Conservation Society of India. Dr. Thomas, over to you. Thank you, Tricia. And I'd just like to uh, uh, say good morning or good evening to all of you uh, and thank Dr. Yada for that very inspirational keynote and Dr. Walzer for that um, very educational overview uh, on uh, emergent diseases and, and COVID-19 in particular. And I'm going to be talking about um, the specific, um, you know, uh, cases of, of COVID-19 in, in some of our uh, large felids at the Bronx Zoo uh, this morning. So next slide, please. So we've had um, eight big cats um, test positive for COVID-19, uh, five tigers. Two of them were Malayan tigers, three were Amur or Siberian tigers, and uh, three African lions. All of, of these cats were adults, uh, ranging from fairly young adults to you know middle to older cats. And the, the cats were housed at, at two very different areas of the zoo. The, the five tigers were all housed um, at one of our exhibits called Tiger Mountain. Uh, our African lions were housed uh, at a separate exhibit uh, called the African Plains. I, I would like to also just point out that we have a second tiger exhibit at the zoo, uh, Wild Asia, that currently has three tigers, and none of those tigers um, have exhibited any signs of illness, nor have our Amur leopard, snow leopard, clouded leopard, cheetah, puma, and serval. So it's just um, two subsets of, of our collection. Um, housed in two um, areas that uh, we're not um, keeping any other cats in. And you know, our assumption is that a staff member that was either asymptomatic or uh, wasn't showing signs of illness um, at the time that he or she interacted with the cats uh, passed uh, the disease on to the cats. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we saw were um, coughing in, in all eight of, of the cats and wheezing in about half of the cats. And one of our tigers was off of feed for two days and wasn't completely off. I mean, she was eating, but just not e eating her full amount. Um, you know, one, one of the tigers did not show any signs at all. Um, Two of the tigers showed signs of illness for just one day. Uh, one tiger showed um, sim exhibited symptoms for four days. And then uh, one tiger, and this was the tiger that we initially tested, uh, who was probably the sickest of, of the animals, coughed for um, six days uh, before we worked her up, collected samples from her, and then she uh, exhibited some signs of illness intermittently for a number of days after that. And this is also the, the tiger that was partially off of feed. And then um, all three African lions exhibited symptoms for only one day. And all of the animals, once they um, exhibited signs of illness, were treated with amoxicillin, which is a broad, broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, next slide, please. And what I can try to do, hopefully you'll be able to hear this, is, um, ah. 
just to, this is the, the coughing sound we're hearing. So, you know, certainly not a, a, a typical sound you would hear from, from a big cat. Um, and again, for much of the animals that were sick, they only exhibited that sign for, for one day. Um, so the, the, the tiger that we first diagnosed was the one that was showing signs of illness the longest. And, and that started on 27 March. Uh, the, the very next morning we started her on amoxicillin uh, again, which is that broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, the cough persisted and um, we immobilized her on, on 2 April just to assess her condition, take radiographs of her chest and to collect um, samples. And what we did was collected both nasal and throat swabs and also a tracheal wash. And we sent those sam uh, samples to two separate veterinary labs and all three of the samples, uh, there was a presumptive positive test uh, for all three samples from both labs. And what's required in the US is then to send um, those samples to the USDA lab in Iowa, and they confirmed the results of the two previous labs um, tests. Uh, next slide, please. So um, once we, we got the, the confirmed positive test on that one tiger. Our assumption was that the other tigers and lions that were exhibiting that this similar symptoms also were positive, but we actually ran uh, fecal PCR tests, which identifies uh, viral DNA in the feces. And those tests um, confirmed um, were detected viral DNA in all of the um, seven cats that exhibited uh, symptoms, you know, the coughing and wheezing, as well as the one tiger that was housed at Tiger Mountain with those four other tigers that was asymptomatic, that exhibited no signs. So um, what the fecal test do, does is detect viral DNA. It actually doesn't confirm uh, shedding of infectious virus. And next slide, please. So our response was, um, once we got that first positive test back on that tiger, to protect all of our felids, uh, not just tigers and lions, but all of the felids in our collection, and, and to protect our staff, we increased a, uh, the amount of personal protective equipment or PPE that our keepers would where whenever they were interacting with tigers or lions or any of our other cats, not only at the Bronx Zoo, but uh, WCS operates four zoos and aquariums in New York. And all four zoos have, have, have um, felids. And so for all of our cats, our keepers would wear coveralls, surgical masks, some form of eye protection and latex gloves. Um, we also encouraged social distancing. You know, Chris made a joke about you don't want to get too close to a lion or tiger. And, and our keepers do get close to them. They interact with them through a protective barrier. We do a lot of positive reinforcement training that enables us to do really amazing things with our cats, ultrasound exams, collect blood samples while they're awake. So we've limited a lot of that positive reinforcement training uh, at this point. We've also limited access to our felid holding areas to those individuals who absolutely need to be there. You know, we've always used, used foot baths in all of our animal areas. We're certainly reinforcing the use of foot baths whenever staff is entering or leaving any uh, area where there are felids. Um, initially, you know, the first couple of days after we got our, the first positive test on the tiger, we, we were just dry cleaning enclosures. We didn't want to hose enclosures and, and potentially um, get any COVID back up into the air. 
uh, now what we're doing is going in, picking up all uh, organic debris and then spraying a disinfectant that we know will kill COVID-19, let it sit for five minutes, is, which is what the manufacturer recommends. And then we hose out the enclosures using a, a fairly weak stream of water. You know, we allow the animals to go outdoors in their either their off exhibit holding yards or the exhibits. And, and I should point out that the, the, the zoo has been closed for eight weeks now as, as part of um, social distancing mandated by the city and state of New York. So uh, we're confident that, that the tigers and lions um, contracted the disease from an employee because the zoo was closed for a long enough period of time before they started showing any signs of illness that there just was no public around. And also the way our exhibits are set up, it's not easy for our public to um, get close to our lions. And in the case of, of the tigers, there's uh, um, glass that separates um, visitors from, from the animals. Um, but we still are allowing our animals to go out in their exhibits, even though there's no public to enjoy them at this point. Uh, and then obviously um, we're asking the keepers that work with all of our cats to immediately report anything that is out of the ordinary. And fortunately there has not been anything out of the ordinary other than those um, eight cases. Next slide, please. And just to give you an idea of um, what I'm talking about when I mention off exhibit areas and, and exhibits. So our exhibits are very highly naturalistic uh, they are typically a uh, hectare or so in size, um, and the big cats, all of our cats are in those exhibits during the hours of operation when the zoo is open. <clears throat> For um, the cat's safety, and so our keepers can get better looks at the animals and interact with them, we move our cats into off exhibit areas at night. And, this is where our more intensive management occurs, where our breeding occurs. And it, especially in these off exhibit areas where uh, we're asking our keepers to kind of social distance from, from our cats at this point. Next slide, please. So we've also, in addition to our felids, increased uh, our level of management with certain other groups of, of animals that we feel might be susceptible to COVID-19. So we've increased you know, protective equipment and enhanced uh, enclosure cleaning with uh, mistelids. And I'm going to include skunks in that group, even though taxonomists will now say they're not technically mistelids, but historically they were. Uh, viverids and bats, now we've had a very long-standing primate prot protocol, probably for close to 25 years that had fairly significant PPE already in place. And the one change we've made with our primate protocol is that our staff is actually wearing full PPE when they're handling and preparing food, just to ensure that any interaction dealing with um, those animals is done in as safe a manner as possible. And you know, I'm very happy to report that we haven't seen any illnesses in, in any of these groups of animals. Next slide. And so um, you know, where we are right now is that um, all five of, of the tigers and the three lions uh, are doing very well right now. They're behaving normally, they're eating well. We haven't seen any coughing in any animals in probably three weeks. Um, and, you know, they, they can't really tell us how they're feeling, but by, you know, all of our assessments, you know, they're, they're doing as well as, as you would expect. Um, um, they want to interact with, with keepers because they enjoy their training sessions, but again, we're still limiting that. Um, but, um, you know, we're, Continuing with the enhanced PPE, we 
haven't had internal discussions about it, but my you know, assumption is that we will continue to maintain PPE for the same length of time that we're doing that with each other. So as long as we're getting direction from you know, city, state, and federal government that when we're out in public and we're wearing masks and practicing social distancing, we're gonna be doing the same thing with our animals at the zoo. And I think that's the last slide. So thank you very much. Yeah. Trisha, you're on mute. Apologies about that. Um, thank you so much, Patrick. I'm sure it was great for all of our viewers to hear your experience right from ground zero. And I'm sure you've given them a lot of valuable insight and tips on how we can actually manage this uh, disease within our ecosystems in India as well. Um, now I'd like to just invite some questions from the audience. We've received some questions during the registration process, as well as we've been getting a lot of questions in during the YouTube live stream right here. Um, so if I could just feel some questions at you, please. <laughs> sure. uh, so the first question we've received is, is the risk of, the, of disease transmission to humans higher in certain wildlife species as compared to others? This is in relation to the current discussions surrounding bats and their demonization for carrying pathogens. You wanna take that, Chris? Yeah, so just thanks, Pat. Um, so that, that is, there is no indication of any infection of humans from any species of wildlife except the original spillover event. And since then, there's been no indication. So none of the species that have been, um, uh, you know, that, that are known to be infected can have shown to infect a human. On a precautionary principle, um, as, as Pat was saying, stay away from them, of course, because, it, you know, if you keep really intense contact, you're probably going to get a PCR positive result in the human at some stage. So, um, but it's just not a, a, an important um, a source of infection. That's really, it's, you know, we have seven point some billion people on this planet and they are a super, super host for this virus. So you've got to be more careful about other people at the moment. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, are the infected big cats at Bronx Zoo, Bronx Zoo showing similar progression of the disease as human beings? What are their symptoms? What is the recovery period for tigers? So, um, again, you know, it, it, tigers can't tell us what's wrong. So, you know, our um, assessments are based on their, their general behavior. And, um, you know, we, we would see that kind of chronic coughing that ranged from six or more days in, in the cat that uh, initially tested positive for COVID-19 to just one day for about half of the cats that um, tested positive and one tiger that was, was asymptomatic and showed no signs at all. Um, you know, a few of the cats were wheezing. I think, you know, they have these kind of coughing fits and then maybe have a difficult time um, getting enough oxygen in their lungs. And so we'd see a little bit of wheezing with some of the cats, but not all. But, you know, behaviorally, they all um, appeared fine. You know, they, uh, with the exception of one animal, it was off feed for just a, a short period of time. They were all eating well. Uh, they wanted to interact with, with their keepers in a normal fashion. So, you know, my sense is that they were not very ill. And so we didn't see the, the wide range of, of symptoms that you see in people, but, you know, we didn't have the ability to take temperatures of our animals on a daily basis. Um, you know, if, if they weren't coughing, you wouldn't know that anything was wrong with any of them. Um, so we have a question for Chris. Can samples collected from wildlife be opened in BS, uh, BSL3 plus facility? Should the facility be exclusively meant for wildlife and not other domestic animals? 
No, you have um, uh, you don't uh, you have to follow the national regulations on using um, testing samples. As far as I know, across most la countries, the um, samples are being treated in quite normal uh, veterinary laboratories um, with the normal precautions. Um, uh, you don't need a BSL three to to process the sample, and the uh, veterinary labs are testing human samples um, in many countries across the world. The next question is, can COVID-19 spill over to other mammalian groups as well? Uh, how will we deal with this scenario? <laughs> Pat, you, want want me to... you can take okay. it and I'll, I'll add my comments later. Right, yeah, I think it's, so I think it's very important to, to um, point out the context in which this could happen. First of all, you need to be very close. So, in a normal wild, in a you know what I call wildlife, um, that's not contained. It's going to be very difficult because even in 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 your parks in India, there there's always going to be more than six feet, of, um, you know, of, of distance, two meters distance between wildlife and people, and you you will tell your your visitors to your parks and to not to spit and you know the normal normal behavior. So um, that would be very difficult. Um, I think the urban um, primates in, in some of the Indian cities are interesting because of course, um, many people will be feeding them and interacting with them and there's a close relationship. So you will possibly see um, some primates um, becoming COVID uh, or acquiring the, the coronavirus. Um, but uh, basically this is a contiguous population of humans and, and primates mixing in the city. So it's the same as with people, but I'd leave it up to Pat for the, for the zoo side. Yeah, well, as, as Chris mentioned in his presentation, we have seen uh, mink in the Netherlands uh, fur farms um, test positive. So, um, you know, we know that that's another group of animals that would be considered highly susceptible and um, you know, we're going to assume that, that primates, would, primates would be another highly susceptible group. Again, we, here at, at our parks in New York, we, we've had a very long standing protocol for, for dealing with primates because of the risk of zoonotic diseases, not just COVID-19. Um, and so for the, the, those groups of animals that I mentioned, the viverids, the mustelids, primates, bats, obviously the cats, um, you know, will maintain uh, enhanced PPE and, and social distancing for probably as, lo as long as we do it with, the, with each other as we go about our daily activities to ensure that we minimize the chance of, you know, staff here uh, infecting any other groups of animals. So Pat, you had, sorry, Chris, you want to add you know, something? A, yeah, so one of the things I think is quite important, but just to add to what Pat said. So the researchers are really looking for a good animal model so they can induce an infection and um, get these animals sick so they can test vaccines and so on. And actually the, the vivarids and mustelids are the, are the best at the moment because they actually really get sick. And um, so those are the ones to keep a real eye on. Even the primates, the, the infecting the rhesus macaques is the only ones we have experimental data on at the moment. It took quite a dose to get them um, really sick as well. So that's um, just to keep in the back of mind. And for cats, for example, have been, cannot be used for um, experimental infection. They just don't get sick enough. Um, so Pat, you had mentioned earlier during your presentation that there are asymptomatic pellets as well. So we've received a question asking, do you have any suggestions on how to deal with such asymptomatic individuals? Well, in, in, the, in the case of um, that particular tiger, uh, it was housed in the same area as the other four tigers that were exhibiting signs um, so we just made the assumption that even though it didn't appear to be ill, that we were treating it as if it was an animal that was ill, uh, and we're just keeping a close eye on it. Um, 
but I think you know for for all of the animals where there's you know a potential um, risk of transmission from from human to to our collection, we're just trying to be really very sensitive and and careful in, in how we deal with those animals. Um, um, you know, as Chris mentioned, there's been no case of an animal transmitting um, infection to a person, but by wearing PPE, we accomplish two things. We protect our staff, uh, but we also then protect the animals by minimizing the risk of, of a, a staff member transmitting illness to, to any of those animals. Dr. Yadav, we have one question for you too. This is from Meghalaya Tiger Reserve. They've asked, um, is there a need to test for COVID-19 in the recently rescued leopard with the injury and having no respiratory illness? Uh, I think uh, if it, uh, it's a rescued, I think they have the access to the animal and it's better to test. Why to take risks? I would suggest to test uh, for the COVID-19. So we have one follow-up question for you. How do you feel about the preparations of Indian Zoo to deal with COVID-19? Uh, this situation, as I have told earlier, was unprecedented. And we, we never thought that such a situation will arise. So all resources have been geared up, like all zoos have been closed for uh, since the lockdown. People are not allowed to enter the zoo unless even, even the keepers, unless they are uh, very well sanitized, people are using PPE, uh, foot, uh, foot baths, and all precautionary measures are being taken up by the zoo keepers, the veterinary doctor. Every zoo has vet, right? So vet, they are under their direction, all, all handling of animals, feeding, and all, all such precautions are being taken up in zoo. And so far, we have not received any confirmative report from any zoo in the country. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. That's great news. Um, back to Chris and uh, Pat. We've received another question. Unless there is a vaccination, in the future, how can we prevent recurrence and or transmission of COVID-19 to animals in the zoo? Uh, by maintaining a, a high level of awareness and, and enhance PPE for those species that we believe are at, at greatest risk. Uh, sorry, Chris, please go ahead. Yeah, and I think, you know, putting it in context, there are a lot of other diseases out there which impact your, your wild felids in India. I mean, namely uh, canine distemper, for example, is by far a much greater risk at the moment for your cats because canine distemper in contrast to COVID-19 actually will kill your cats. And so this is really important. Put it in context and think about the measures you take in the broader context of other diseases. Tuberculosis, um, canine distemper come to mind immediately. And they're a big threat to your tigers and to your, your um, lions. So, you know, it's, it needs to be balanced. So the measures you take now may actually have a lot of positive effect because you're actually protecting against this very prevalent um, cat diseases. So the next question we have is, what would be the testing protocol to follow for big cats in their wild habitats? If it spreads in the wild, what might be the transmission rate? So um, there is really no indication that it's going to spread in the wild. There will be individual cases. Um, you, you, as we've said multiple times, you do need to be very close. The infectious dose has to be very high. So you need, um, you know, in a normal environment with this outside environment, it's, it's just very, very unlikely you're going to get an infectious uh, transmission. You know, if you're handling a cat, um, and I'm sure Pat can, can uh, add to that, if you're handling a cat, transferring a cat, of course, the veterinarians and staff should be wearing PPE. You shouldn't be breathing down its um, throat as you intubate or whatever you're doing. But in, in all non-manipulated wildlife in the wild, um, it's, it's really not a concern at this point in time, of course, yeah. 
Um, speaking of uh, how to handle cats and what procedures should be maintained, there's another question. Are there any precautions to be maintained while conducting post-mortem on any suspected animal cases? Uh, Chris, you're on mute. Uh, I'll just take out Pat and just um, just the normal precautions you you always take when you you know you're wearing gloves and mask and um, generally when you're working um, uh, on doing necropsies um, since this is a um, an area where you may also have rabies and so on you're going to be taking good PPE anyway so you you're fine. I'd just like to also take a moment to thank all of our audience. They've been keeping the questions coming and I would request you to just keep going because this is a once in, this is a very unique experience to be able to pick the brain of these experts. So keep your questions coming and our team is on the back end looking at each of them and sending them forward to us. Uh, coming to our next question. How do you think this will affect exhibit maintenance and animal scheduling, especially in some zoos? Different individual cats share on-stage enclosures, but are never physically together. So, so you know, it's, it's a, a little bit of a difficult question to answer because um, all zoos are different. Um, all exhibits are different. Um, some big cats are maintained in indoor, air, or it's not even big cats, but cats are maintained in indoor facilities or exhibits. Others have uh, outdoor exhibits, some have a combination of the two. And so um, you know it, it, it's, it's not like one answer will satisfy all needs. Um, here in the Bronx, um, with, with our tigers, because we have more tigers than we have exhibits, uh, we tend to rotate them through their exhibits. Um, their outdoor exhibits. Um, and um, again, because uh, as, as Dr. Walzer mentioned, there's no evidence that there's any cat to cat transmission. We, we don't at this point see any significant risk in, in doing that. And so we continue to do that. Um, and we just try to uh, maintain as high a level of hygiene as possible in their off exhibit areas, which can be uh, more effectively cleaned on a daily basis. Um, but again, it, you know, different zoos have, have different setups. And so there's no one answer that will satisfy every zoo. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is, what behavioral changes do the big cats exhibit after contracting the virus? And do we have any information on whether once a big cat has been cured, can they catch it again? Um, so to answer the, the second part of the question first, no, we don't have any evidence. And you know, I think that's something that you know we're grappling as, as our own species is what level, if you've had COVID-19, what level of immunity do you have moving forward and can, can you get it again? And there seems to be some conflicting um, reports on whether you, you have a, a, enough immunity that you can't catch it again. And we certainly don't know that answer with, with any cats. Um, and now I forgot the first part of your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right, I'm happy to repeat it. Uh, what what behavioral changes do the big cats exhibit after contracting the virus? Yeah, so, you know, again, behaviorally, um, they they appeared pretty normal. It was just that really unusual cough, and then with a few animals, um, you know, they'd be wheezing after a coughing bout. Uh, you know, and, and the cough, and hopefully that sound was able to, to come through to everyone. You know, it's, it's a very different sound than you would expect to hear a lion or tiger make. So, I mean, it's not something that I think people that work with those animals will misinterpret as any other kind of vocalization. Um, but at least what we've seen here, it, really that was the one kind of distinctive symptom was was that really persistent cough 
and it was persistent whether it lasted just one day or lasted over multiple days in the case of a couple of our animals. So I do believe that the audience was able to hear your sound clip because we had several reactions on our YouTube live while that sound clip was playing. So I do assume everyone was able to catch that. Good. Our next question comes from one of our more environmentally conscious viewers. What disposal mechanisms are followed for the biomedical waste and protective gears? Um, we do have um, a pretty rigid um, protocol for um, biohazard materials. Um, it's not something I'm personally responsible for, so I, I, I can't right now tell you exactly what they are, but we do dispose of, of all our um, materials that have a potential biohazard in, in an appropriate fashion. Thanks, thank you for that. Um, so now we have a bit of a long question, so you'll need to bear with me. What was the feed given to the tigers at convalescence? What was the disinfection protocol of the meat fed? If the if meat was fed, and a brief of feed disinfection. Okay, so all of our large cats are fed a commercially prepared diet that has all the vitamins. Some uh, it's a beef diet that has all the vitamins and minerals that they require already added in. So we haven't changed their diet at all. Um, and again, there was only one animal that was was partially off feed and, and, and she, she was eating, she just wasn't eating her normal amount. Um, and so we, we haven't altered their diet at all. Um, and, um, you know, normally if a cat, a big large cat goes off feed for a number of days, you know, four or five days, we might switch um, their diet around to try and stimulate their appetite but that has not been the case with this um, bout of, of sickness that we've seen with our big cats here. So we haven't had to do, do anything with their diet. Uh, the next question we have is US and India both hold good livestock populations. Is there any assessment on the threat level so far to livestock? So, so there has been um, trials to assess um, livestock species, swine, pig, um, uh, swine and um, poultry and ducks. Um, I'm actually not sure the cattle right now, but I can look quickly, but um, all those species were, were unable to be infected. So um, there's, that is absolutely a very, very low risk. Remember there's a coronavirus circulating in, in cattle already, which is very distinct though. Um, so. I think you're, it's not a risk to livestock at all. Uh, what are the risks when exotic species are wrongly released into the wild from a disease transmission lens? So um, in all reintroduction type of pro programs or translocations, as you, you have quite a few in India, um, it, this really depends a lot on the on the handling time. So if it's a reintroduction program, there should be a very robust protocol in place, which examines the animals before they're released for all the common and known diseases of that species. So the you know the clear clear ones, canine distemper, tuberculosis, depending on the species, um, those are done and those are uh, available uh, broadly. If you're translocating an animal, um, you know, the typical one, the leopard in the well, and you take it out of the well and it's immediately released back in the wild, you're not going to be worried about any um, disease transmission risks there because the contact with humans is very, very short. And the animal has already been in touch with humans for weeks probably because it's been in the area where it fell into the well, for example. So, you know, you just need um, a, a good protocol. It depends on the time, it depends on the species, but of course, any reintroduction needs to be looking at um, uh, diseases. And there's a lot of diseases out there that are not um, related to coronaviruses. And I will just add, we've, um... The Bronx Zoo has been involved in, in a number of um, reintroduction programs that involve uh, 
amphibians. And what we do is rear them in biosecure facilities. And they're not in contact with any other part of, of our collection. So that when they're reintroduced, uh, we're not introducing uh, non-native pathogens into the environment. And now the next question is very, very relevant to us Indians. So is there any evidence that with an increase in climate temperature, COVID-19 infection may decrease in cats and animals? So across the, uh, um, across the globe, this is obviously a, a question which has um, been on every epidemiologist's mind um, in dampening and flattening the curve. That would be great. But what we have seen um, in many places where it is actually hot at this time of the year, Southeast Asia um, and Africa and similar, it's not, it does not seem to have a, um, a dampening effect on the spread. That's sort of the, the data that's available now. There doesn't seem to be that, you know, the, the um, yearly flu dampening, which happens with warming. So you still need to be careful um, and assume that the virus is still circling several at the same level. There is always the hope that there will be a slight dampening during the um, summer months. Certainly surfaces, this, um, the survival of virus on surfaces in intense UV and dry conditions is going to be decreased. We know that, but um, human to human transmission will unfortunately continue. So we have just about 10 minutes left. And I finally actually have a question from myself to both Chris and Pat. Um, so I'm sure your teams and your handlers working with these animals day in, day out, you build a lot of relationships and it must be heartbreaking for you also to watch your animals dealing with this. So if you could just share some of your personal experiences or some stories that touched you during your entire uh, management of this COVID-19 case in Bronx Zoo. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, it is hard for our staff that works with our, our lions and tigers and all our cats to have to social distance uh, because they are very passionate about the animals that they care for. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, they're, they're able to do some really amazing things with the animals just through voluntary participation. Things that, you know, when I was a keeper, you know, 40 years ago, you know, I would never have dreamed that we would have been able to do. But, you know, just the thought of asking a tiger to slide its tail out from under its enclosure so we can get a blood sample from the tail or, you know, press its abdomen up against an enclosure front so we can do an ultrasound to determine if she's pregnant. Um, you know, our, our keepers miss that. I think our animals miss that as, as well. I mean, we, we treat them as wild animals. We, we don't try to make pets of them, but there, there's no question that there's a very close relationship um, between the keepers and the animals. You know, the first couple of days where, when we started wearing enhanced PPE, you know, for as big and powerful as tigers and lions are, um, you know, that's something that's strange. It's suddenly, you know, people that they know are look a little bit different. And so it just took them a day or two to kind of get used to the fact that, oh, I still know this person. They're just kind of, they look funny. Um, you know, I think all of our keepers look forward to the day when they can interact with, with our cats, um, more closely again, but just like people who have, you know, there's a new normal, and can you know, caps the cats are, are pretty adaptive and and are doing well with the fact that uh, we still do training, but now we just do it with from a distance, <laughs> um, and it takes a little longer for them to get food rewards. <laughs> then it's not quite as immediate, but but you know they're adapting, and our, our keepers are adapting to that as well. Chris, would you like to add anything? Well, you know, I don't want to be a, <laughs> I don't want to be a downer. So I've been really tied up in this, um, in this COVID-19 outbreak because, uh, you know, WCS has a global conservation program. So, you know, by mid-January, we were really tight, already 
involved in this and are closing our first offices by the end of January in the Southeast Asian area. And we've sort of gone around the whole globe. So it's been a continuous um, pressure on us dealing with our uh, animals in the wild and the protection and our staff. And it's very tiring. So one of the things that really just baffles me that the 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 amount of attention I and I think it's interesting from a you know from a social society point of view at a time when there were New York as you as you probably heard is the epicenter in is a global epicenter of the outbreak we have hundreds of people dying per day we had we still have unfortunately it's a real real tragedy and it's it's you know it's it's not. It's not a fair virus. It's killing the people who are, you know, old, and it's the people who are under um, living from less resources and so on. But in a time when we had nearly seven to eight hundred people dying a day, the media was interested in the tigers, and that is also I understand it, you know. But on the other side, it's heartbreaking to see how it's switched, and then you spend a days on talking about tigers. So you know, we need to put things into perspective. Um, and and think about our front line and the people who are dying and you know these cats are getting mild disease thankfully so that's my take on it. Thank you so much for sharing your personal views and also letting us see behind the veil so to speak. Uh, Dr. Yadav may I request that since you're part of the team that actually coordinates and works with the entire network of zoos across India is there any personal experience or personal stories regarding this subject that you'd like to share with us? Um, in fact, uh, no, all zoos are closed for the people, right? And uh, they are uh, having a good time. Animals, I have received, uh, received reports that animals are having a stress-free and good time in their enclosures. They're, they're started be having, exhibiting the normal natural behavior. So that's a good part of this lockdown. I think we're seeing that both within the zoos and on our streets. I think India is reporting more cases of wildlife taking over the streets than any other country at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patrick R. Thomas, Dr. Chris, Christian Walzer, sorry, Dr. Christian Walzer and Dr. S.P. Yadav. I am done grilling you all for today, so I'll hand over to Shantanu now to close the session and to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Cheshire. Yeah, wow. Thanks very much. Uh, that's really a nail-biting session uh, for all of us. And uh, definitely, um, uh, we could have um, uh, two, three hours more to discuss in details uh, because uh, we saw a lot of questions coming, but definitely we cannot address uh, uh, all the questions uh, uh, for in our go. Uh, so um, uh, probably I'll um, uh, start uh, what Chris said. It's very important that uh, when thousands of people are dying every day, then um, uh, shifting the focus uh, uh, to animals, uh, wild animals, it's very difficult. And definitely that's uh, why where uh, Central Zoo Authority, WCS, the Habitat Trust and the HCL Foundation, we are to become the voice of the voiceless. So that's very important uh, uh, that we are concerned uh, for the conservation uh, of these wild animals, the, this wild habitat. This is very important uh, to conserve such uh, conditions. And all over the globally, we have seen quite a, though uh, definitely there are loss uh, um, uh, quite a bit uh, on uh, financially and human lives as well. But uh, in many areas like environment quality or uh, uh, the um, habitat quality have increased uh, in this um, one and a half month or two months uh, period, there are a lot of uh, reports that wildlife have returned to many areas where uh, um, uh, they have retreated. So there were a lot of cases um, of some, uh, such, and we really need to um, 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 work more on uh, that. So uh, definitely, and so uh, I like to thank uh, Chris, uh, Patrick, and Dr. Jadav uh, for your time and patience uh, to be with us, uh, the Capital Trust and the HCL Foundation uh, team uh, for this webinar, the preparation, and also the larger um, uh, uh, WCS team, the Habitat Trust team, and the HCL Foundation uh, team who worked uh, uh, considerably in the background to make this uh, event uh, really success. Those who have couldn't able to join this event or maybe uh, joined a little late, 
for them. Uh, the entire recording of this session will be available uh, in the Habitat Trust and the HCL Foundation uh, social media handles and pay, uh, pages. So you can definitely follow and share um, uh, your um, uh, comments and feedbacks um, uh, there, there. So definitely I like to thank uh, uh, all of the uh, participants and the presenters again. So this is Shantanu Basu from HCL Foundation. Um, thanking all of you. Very good night. Stay safe. Stay home. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Goodbye. Right. Thank Stay you well, so everyone. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, HCL Foundation Habitat Trust. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.